Thanks, Brian. I'd like to welcome you all here today to Wakehold to the VSPC facility, which is really a landmark when it comes to battery technology, and you're going to see that later today. Uh, if I check my watch, I think it's now 65 years and 45 minutes since I popped out in Footscray. And in the intervening 65 years, of course, I've got to see a change in energy, energy management, a real revolution, and the Bulldogs win their second premiership. Now, whoever would have thought that would happen? But it has, uh, and I'm very, very pr proud to be part of all of that. Uh, Lithium Australia, of course, is a business built on sustainability in the battery industry. Our aim is to deliver sustainable and ethical products to the battery industry, and in doing that, we've developed five business units, separate business units that operate autonomously. The first is uh, pretty ordinary, I guess, apart from the guys who uh, work within it, and that's uh, the exploration division. We have exploration projects based in Australia, Mexico, Alaska, Germany, and a few other places around the globe. Probably one of the largest exploration portfolios of any lithium company in the world. Uh, but when we got involved in the business in the first place, what we did was look at lithium deportment and found that there was more lithium going out in waste streams around the world that never got into the supply chain. So on that basis, there really wasn't an argument for digging another hole. What you should do is take the materials that other people have already mined, take advantage of that embedded cost and process it through to lithium chemicals and so on and so forth. Uh, so we developed technology to do that. The reason it wasn't being done was a matter of operating cost and unavailable appropriate technology. So that brings us to our second business division which is uh, headed up with our uh, revolutionary and proprietary silage technology which dissolves lithium minerals and is capable of extracting lithium chemicals from them and other byproducts. Uh, the next business division of course is VSPC uh, which you're at today and you'll see how the cathode powders are generated, uh, how we take those lithium chemicals and add value to them and ultimately in this plant which is a real triumph for technology, I've got to say. In this plant, we do just that on a pilot scale and then on a laboratory scale for testing purposes. We take that cathode powder through to cathodes uh, and produce batteries for testing. So that gives us a chain that starts off with uh, waste materials that have been rejected by other people and can take it right through to batteries. We've tried to make the uh, circular economy and to do that we've had to uh, bridge one additional link. We've got research programs going in a number of locations in Australia, several universities involved, a little bit of work in North America and that's all about keeping batteries out of landfill, capturing the value that's in those batteries because there's an enormous amount of money goes into those batteries and at the moment most of them get thrown away. Recycling rates in Australia around about two to three percent and on a global basis only ten percent. Uh, so we've just about cracked that and effectively that completes the circle and if you if you count up the number of business divisions I said we've got five and that's only four. What is the fifth? Politician bashing. And we spend a lot of money and a lot of effort on that and I think you are going to see the fruits of what was once a very very effective research and development policy in this country and unfortunately the short-sighted government has cut that back and will make plants like this funded by that means a thing of the past unless we all get out there and lobby and have that changed. So that's the fifth and very important business division that we have and I urge you all to support a change in the R&D policy and get it back to what it was, something that can build plants like VSPC for the good of the society, for conservation's sake. Let's get those batteries out of landfill, let's produce a better battery and let's produce some of the world's best cathode powders which in fact has been done in this plant and I've got to say we took over VSPC in about February. We've uh, uh, put together a fantastic team and a number of people that were on the original team. We've recommissioned the plant uh, and we've done so successfully from the very first production run on that plant. We've now done three runs and we've got uh, cathode powders up to specification. So with that in mind and going back to the original principle, we have 
waste material being moved from or has been moved from uh, Kalgoorlie to Sydney where we have a pilot plant in conjunction with Ansto. That pilot plant is producing today lithium chemicals. Uh, this particular chemical is uh, lithium carbonate that you can take twice a day, 600 mils. Uh, um, I tell you what, it's, it's pretty good stuff. Anyway, twice a day, 600, 600 mils after, after meals. Most important that you take food with it. But if you're not using it for that purpose, and a lot of people do, make cathode powders out of it. It's, ter it's terrific stuff. So today we are producing lithium chemicals out of mine waste at Ansto in Sydney. Uh, we are shortly to move those chemicals here to VSPC, convert those chemicals into cathode powders, the cathode powders into cathodes and manufacture batteries out of it for testing purposes. That will be without a shadow of a doubt a world first. So keep your eyes open today, you're going to see something really very, very interesting. Now to back me up and give you a little bit of in entertainment, we've got Professor Ray Wills. Ray's uh, a futurist, he's going to tell you about the opportunities in the industry and then following that we'll have the official opening by Ian McFarlane. Now Ian's a stalwart of the mining industry, many of you will know him from opposition and government where he's played major roles in uh, resource management of this country and today uh, heads up the Queensland Resources Council and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Ian here as part of the team. So with that I'll hand over to Ray Wills. Thank you Ray. Thanks Adrian. Hi everyone. Um, in celebrating Adrian's birthday we've got to reflect the changes of the technology uh, that have happened over that time frame. Uh, to get to this kind of device where we all have one in our pockets right now. So a normal test for an audience like this is to understand how we're digitalising our economy. So the first question I have to ask is who's still got a flip phone in their pocket? Is there anyone? Who's got a smartphone? Who's got a smartphone? Have we got a complete audience? Who's got a copper network in their pocket? Copper networks are the old technology we've moved on. Batteries are actually changing the way that we view the 21st century economy because they are fundamentally shifting the way we interact with the economy. And we've have been having a practice match on mobile batteries now since the 90s, but what we're really getting to now is devices that consume a lot of power, demand a lot of power, and so therefore need very good batteries to support them. If we look at the electricity that sits in a battery like this in your mobile phone, it's worth about $1.25 a kilowatt hour. So we're paying a premium for the electricity that comes in this battery. And we actually don't care about that. What we want to know is this battery will last long enough uh, for our next phone call. As we move beyond that to think about where else can we use batteries, we start to think about the economics of how we deliver on those batteries. If we actually use batteries to power a car instead of petrol, uh, and if we actually substitute petrol, then that petrol is worth about 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Out of the plug in the wall, we're paying about 27 cents a kilowatt hour for that electricity. So logically, as we actually expand our use of batteries and our mobility that's driven by mobile power sources, we need additionality in that, uh, in that delivery. So batteries in motor cars become the rational next step, and we've heard a lot about uh, that happening in the last little while. In fact, if I talk about some of the statistics, that are associated with the electric vehicle industry right now, they really are quite extraordinary. If we only consider what's happened in 2018 and we consider what investment has been announced by the global motor car industry, to date there's been $350 billion worth of investment announced by the global car industry in electric vehicles up to this point in August. That's an extraordinary investment number. We all got hung up on Elon Musk and his, his gigafactory and the cars that he's building. They always tend to be the headline story, but there's a $350 billion investment following him. And they're all going to need raw materials, they're all going to need downstream processing, they're all going to need delivery of materials out of cathode factory. Perhaps just as extraordinary is that when Elon announced his factory back in 2016 and he said he'd build it by 2020, but he actually opened it in 2017, he announced a 35 gigawatt factory. What we have today, in terms of global announcements of new factory production, is 334 gigawatt hours of production by 2022. That's 10 times more than Musk announced, and it actually represents 40 new factories that last year weren't even announced yet. 
So we're seeing an extraordinary rate of change in terms of our ability to deliver on batteries. That represents a whole range of opportunities from anybody in the supply chain, from all the way from upstream uh, digging rocks and making big rocks into small rocks, to concentrating, to refining, to processing, to actually coming out with uh, lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide materials, and then taking the next extraordinary step of actually manufacturing into, uh, into cathodes, into anodes, into battery materials, and then thinking about how that moves further downstream uh, into the additionality of things that we can do with those batteries. Mo mobile devices are simply the first measure of it. Mobile devices, in some senses, are the practice match. Because for electric cars, we want the same thing. We want batteries to last longer. We want to be able to drive further. And so the technology that's going into adapting for these mobile devices is absolutely pre-adapting us to a very strong transition into electric vehicles. How quickly might that happen? Uh, I've got a fairly strong view, that, uh, an ambitious view, that by the mid-20s uh, we'll actually start to see the end of the production of combustion engines. Others are saying 2035, others are saying 2040. What we all agree on is it's going to change. What we all agree on is batteries will be the core component of that change. So what we have to do in Australia, particularly where of all of the battery materials that you need in a battery, the 10 most important ones, every one of those minerals is found in Australia. And so we have a, a unique opportunity to produce batteries in, or battery materials in Australia, to value add to that battery uh, material stream in Australia, but then to continue to move downstream. And what's happening here is, of course, a very important step in us moving all the way downstream. There have been some extraordinary announcements from Australia, fairly small, um, but Australia is now building electric trucks uh, down in Melbourne. Australia is now talking about uh, moving our mining fleet from a diesel-powered electric motor to simply a battery-powered electric motor. Not much for change, but it will be an electric fleet instead of a diesel-powered fleet. All of that starts to have consequences for very big things like GDP and productivity uh, and profitability of businesses. Why would we move downstream and why would we start to make use of these technologies? The first part is, I've explained one, uh, the electricity that goes into a motor car is cheaper than the fuel that goes into a motor car. If we can save 30% on our energy bills for transport, wouldn't that be great news for regional Australia? Wouldn't that be great news for mining operations that are competing on the world stage and looking to cons consistently erode their costs for greater profitability? But even better than that, electric motors are also more efficient. So not only are we using cheaper energy, but we're actually using less of it to do the same job. Part of the principle of a circular economy is a really simple phrase that every business tries to do every, do, every day, and that's doing more with less. How do we actually do more product, get more productivity, and deliver more value over time? And this electrification associated with the mobility is all a reflection of the changing of the 21st century economy. So we're in an extraordinary change, stage of change uh, for our economy couple more minutes, I'm just checking my time. Uh, these devices are more useful than just being a phone. Um, where we get to really big numbers in battery production after electric vehicles is then to stationary storage. Obviously the world's been building a lot of new energy sources lately, mostly renewable sources. In fact, for the last three years, the world has built more capacity in renewables than in traditional energy generation. And when trucks like that drive past in the future, They'll drive past quietly on electrics. These are the part of the change. But going back to the renewables, one of the things that is absolutely true with renewables is they're intermittent. Uh, on days like today, we might want a bit of battery backup to help us. But if we want that to be economic, it can't be at 27 cents. It's got to be below 10 cents. It's really got to be below about 5 cents a kilowatt hour of energy delivery. To get to that price point in the market, in an economic sense, only requires a couple of things. The two key words a scale and volume. We have to be able to scale up production and as we increase volume we bring costs down. As we move from expensive power on a mobile phone to less expensive power on a motor car, the next step is less expensive power in battery storage. And that's when we start to even add further to the valuable resources that we have in Australia and our ability to downstream those in value adding in Australia uh, and through critical processes like the creation of cathodes and cathode materials for battery manufacturing. So it's an extraordinary time to be thinking about this industry. It's an extraordinary time to looking at the massive numbers that are associated with this. 
if we dig up the sorts of material we need, we're actually looking at two or three hundred million tonnes of ore out of Australia by about 2025, much well above the million tonnes or so that we're currently doing, a couple of million tonnes. So we've got to really scale up. The question is, can we do that? Well, Australia, good hard rock miners. Australia in the last 10 years has gone from 200 million tonnes of iron ore to 800 million tonnes of iron ore. We're very, very capable in this space. We're very efficient in this space. We're great miners. What we need to do is take that uh, same ability, that same capability, that same project management and bring it downstream and make sure that as we move downstream we're actually bringing those efficiencies of scale, that efficiencies of project management and those efficiencies to, uh, particularly to Australia so that we can impact on Australia's GDP, we can impact on Australia's productivity, we can actually deliver greater value for the whole of the Australian community and value adds like this particular project with the VSPC uh, is absolutely essential to completing that. I think that's sufficient time. I think we've addressed the question, Adrian. I don't know if there's time for questions. I think we'd best move on. <laughs> Just following up on a, a couple of the statements that Ray made, uh, the battery chain within about five years' time is probably going to be worth something like $2 trillion. Now, that's a lot of dollars. And what glues it all together? Research and development, the sort of thing that you're going to see here today. Now, what the short-sighted federal government has done is improved their bottom line by $4 billion by cutting back on the R&D rebate to make sure that these things are never going to be built again. But you know, Australia should have the tiger by the tail. We can control the supply chain because we actually control all of the raw materials. So most of the batteries around the world come from right here in Australia. The raw materials do. We want to see the value add. And if we could harness just a small proportion of the value of that supply chain, we could double the GDP of Australia in five years. But not if you cut out that $4 billion in R&D rebates. Over to Ian. Thank you, Ian. Well, thanks very much, Adrian, and uh, thanks for the for the um, for the hospital pass, I guess you'd call it. Um, look, I know, and, and Adrian introduced me as a long-term resources minister. In fact, I think I'm still the longest-serving resources minister Australia's ever had, but. During that time, uh, I was also the Minister for Innovation and R&D, so for the same eight years. And also, uh, in the last part of my... I should have known that was going to happen, I saw it twice. Um, in the last part of my uh, Cabinet career, I was also the Minister for Science. So the issues around innovation, development, maximisation of value-add and, and the incredible ingenuity of Australians are certainly very familiar to me. Um, the other thing is that innovation inevitably goes hand in hand with the resources industry. It is one of the best industries in Australia at turning good ideas into uh, innovative outcomes. And some of the remote uh, guidance systems that they're using and remote um, management of machinery, where BHP, for instance, runs machines in central Queensland from Queen Street in Brisbane. The, the flotation systems that we use in, in separating uh, precious metals and, and, and the, uh, from, from, uh, from the other bodies within the, uh, within the um, base metal copper uh, and, and the like processing chains, a, a process that was developed here in Australia. Adrian talked about flip phones. When I first became a minister, I had a flip phone and uh, a device which I can't even remember the name of, but uh, I know I've got a, a brand new one sitting in my cupboard upstairs. It was a little calendar thing that you carried around, but it's so long now. Um, iPhones weren't even invented. And the bane of everyone's life, with, as devices got better and faster and carried more information, was that the batteries kept going flat. And so need pushes innovation and innovation delivers and so we've seen tremendous progress in the development of, of all battery systems but particularly lithium batteries and interestingly it's that drive that was uh, put into developing uh, longer running batteries for for um, for PDAs and and, uh, and the devices we now use 
that actually has driven the, the potential to have electric vehicles. Now, I'm not quite sure I'm there with Ray in terms of electric cars. Um, the other school of thought is that there'll be a leapfrog over electric into hydrogen. Either way, the resource industry wins, but in the meantime, there's going to be huge demand, not only for lithium, but for copper. An electric vehicle has about four times as much copper in it as a conventional vehicle. And so we will see the demand, uh, particularly for um, for the resources around batteries and, and the like, absolutely skyrocket. And, and I think if we look at it in, in the way, in the way it's going at the moment, the appetite for these sorts of uh, for, for for batteries is just voracious. And to see a Queensland-based operation produced from some of the best brains in Queensland, that innovation also using um, what is common, you know, basically the waste that's left on the side of a a potential uh, of a of a past mine being used in the, in the process is a good news story from every front because people want sustainability these days they, and to see an operation where the, a company like VSP PC is recycling waste and turning it into lithium and ultimately into batteries is certainly a great thing. I, uh, I note, Adrian, your concerns about R&D and I'm not involved in politics anymore and I certainly don't follow it anymore. Well, that part's a lie, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I am, uh, in, in one of my other jobs, uh, the chairman of the Innovative uh, Manufacturing Cooperative Research Centre in Melbourne. And any time you take away an incentive to go out and invent something, take a commercial risk, build something out of it, then Australia loses because you go anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, and research and development is absolutely being pursued by the government. So. Uh, I happen to know the current Prime Minister reasonably well and I remember that he was a treasurer and they all drink from the same well when they're the treasurer, but now he's Prime Minister. I think it might be a good time to go and have another chat to him and I might be floating around Canberra next week, so if I get the opportunity, Adrian, there's, a, there's something I'll do for you. I guess if, if we look at the potential of, of, of this particular facility and the pilot that it creates and the growth out of that, it is as exponential as the demand for batteries. So I want to congratulate everyone involved in VSPC. I want to congratulate you, Adrian, for having the courage to take on, a, was it the fourth of the five? It was the fourth of the five. Uh, I wish everyone the greatest of success with this facility, and I now declare it officially open. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ian. And I'll look forward to a report after you've returned from Canberra. Uh, could I now hand over to Mike Vasey or Mike will uh, explain what we're doing for the rest of the afternoon, I hope. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Ian. And, and thank you, Ray. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, welcome again. Uh, what we have planned now, for those that are interested, um, we're proposing that we divide into groups of no more than 10 and the team led by uh, John Worsley in the, in the orange in the centre there uh, will take you through the plant, um, also show you the laboratory where the electrochemical uh, testing is done and, and also the synthesis of the cathode materials at, at small scale. So um, we'll break it here. Uh, those that are interested, um, Please join us in the lobby of the of the office building. Um, also, we have some refreshments on hand for those who want to just stay outside and chat um, and, and catch up. Please, uh, please take advantage of that. So, we'll see you in the lab and in the plant. Thank you.